Advanced care plans give um, health professionals a clear guideline as to what the person wants. The value of an advanced care plan is firstly that it gets people thinking about uh, the whole issue and it gets them talking with their family and that probably is the most important thing. The importance of the program is allowing people to make those choices while they're still capable of doing so. It's good to say what you want and talk about the issues that are important to you. Advanced care planning is about people being able to make their own choices in relation to health care should they become incapacitated and unable to make decisions. An advanced care plan can be made by anyone over 18 at any stage of life and is usually done in conjunction with family. It's very important to have an advanced care plan um, in this day and age. There's many, many medical treatments that are on offer. Um, and people need to understand their values and their wishes on what living well means so that they can make choices at the end of life, so that they can live as well as they can until they die and then die the way that they'd like. An advanced care plan is a living document. This means that a patient can change their mind at any time. While you are coherent, while you have a voice, nobody's going to take that away from you. Research in Australia and overseas overwhelmingly indicates that the vast majority of people who have an advanced care plan have their end-of-life wishes met. If not, you're so why aren't advanced care plans thought of as standard practice? A New South Wales Department of Health study found that both patients and health practitioners can be reluctant to openly discuss end-of-life care. A number of issues were identified, including the complexity involved in decision-making, anxiety when speaking about death, denial, patient fear over whether or not they can amend an advanced care plan, a lack of trust in the process and general confusion about the term advanced care plan. There may be barriers to raising uh, the issues of, of the mortality advanced care plan, they may come from within, you may feel uncomfortable for uh, some reason, a past experience perhaps, and you may detect a, a level of resistance from, from the patient. But usually, you know, there's a way in with a, with a casual uh, question or remark, and indeed often once you get that initial impetus going, then it uh, really is quite straightforward. People come to me as a patient um, through the palliative care service um, and as part of my holistic approach to care I introduce um, advanced care planning within my nursing um, process and that's part of the, the care that I offer um, and I might introduce the idea um, and the person then may need to go and talk to other people to get advice on whether this is something they'd like to do. Discussion about end-of-life care will often come up in the GP surgery. The role of the GP in ascertaining a patient's wishes in relation to treatment options is a matter of preference. Many GPs believe that their role is to support the patient through the advanced care plan process, rather than directing it. Also, to encourage healthy discussion between the patient and his or her family. The subject of advanced care planning came up when Adele, who lives in the ACT, went to see her local GP, Dr Craig Brown. Around the corner, the door here. Have a seat there. Thank you. It sounds like I've got a bit of a cold, but I'm getting over it. That's not my problem. Um, I wanted to come and see you today because I'm getting more and more worried about my memory. Um, and. Um, I've got a bad history of Alzheimer's in my family and my, my dad had um, a, an Alzheimer's dementia and he was in a nursing home with that and so did his yes, mother. Now, have you and heard of advanced care plans? What's advanced care plans? 
Well, there are a plan for you to make out now, looking to the future when you may not be able to make your own decisions. I had a very pleasant consultation with Adele today and she was able to verbalise clearly about her experiences uh, in her family, particularly to, with respect to dementia. And from there it was quite easy to, opportun to opportunistically introduce advanced care uh, planning and uh, she was able to take all that on board and and to gather the resources and I look forward to following up with her. Oh, okay, so while we're chatting I will download some documents. I think we like to assume that we know what uh, our patients want but we can be wrong and I think you do need to have explicit conversations with your patients and uh, referring them to um, the Respecting Patient Choices program is uh, certainly uh, one way of establishing that. It's really important that health professionals actually help people in the community to talk about death and dying. We know that community members would like to uh, utilise their health professionals in developing advanced care plans and it's important that health professionals actually facilitate those conversations, that they don't feel concerned themselves about any taboos around discussion of death and dying, and they actually help people to work through what their choices are for end-of-life care. The Respecting Patient Choices program is working very well in the ACT. Just as an example, I had an older couple come to see me uh, this week who wanted to complete their uh, documentation because a neighbour of theirs who had been very active had actually had recently had a stroke and is now incapable of making decisions and is in full-time care in a nursing home, which has become a huge strain on family and friends who are taking care of him. And they decided that it was time for them to get their values and their wants around their end-of-life care into documents so that their family and friends were well aware in advance of what they wanted to happen at that time. I'll have a look at my timetable and we'll split them up into about Four or five. The people that are training at the moment in the ACT generally tend to be nurses, pastoral carers and at the moment our main focus is on residential aged care facility staff and that ha that's working extremely well because it means that we're getting that target group to complete their documentation prior to being admitted to a hospital environment. I think it would be really good if advanced care planning was a routine part of medical care. I think that it would help guide us as caregivers to know what people want and it would help um, people to have the choices and be respected as well as they can at the end of life. It's a really good relationship that Emma and I have. We work together quite a lot. Um, Emma might ring me about uh, some questions about end of life issues. Um, I might ring her about some of the process or legislation issues. So we do ring each other quite a bit and I find it um, really supportive and helpful. Would you say the same? Yes, and recently I had a lady who came to visit me and she had some quite specific questions about end of life and types of treatment that she might require and whether or not her attorney would be able to make those decisions on her behalf legally. And I was able to contact Nikki and get that extra reassurance about whether or not that was right. So I really value that working relationship that we have and it's it's an additional resource. If there's nursing staff or health practitioners who are considering doing the training but are a little bit unsure, I'd suggest that they go onto the national website respectingpatientchoices.org.au to just get a bit more background information about how the program works and how important it is in the current climate of healthcare. Once they've had a look over there, they can feel free to contact a local consultant in their area to discuss in a little bit more detail about how the training works and the type of commitment. I think sometimes staff might be concerned about the commitment that they have to give to completing the training. 
it's not onerous and it's certainly very valuable so I think if they can get that background information it will put them in better stead to make that decision. One of the important issues at the moment is that there's insufficient training in end-of-life care for health professionals. What we're seeing is, is that all health professionals have training in something like CPR, although they'll rarely use this. But we know that all pro health professionals will actually be providing end-of-life care. Additional training for GPs is very important and it should start from the early days with medical students and young doctors, and that is coming to the fore. For general practice out in the field, uh, there is the PEPA program and there's also the Respecting Patient Choices uh, website with its excellent modules and the Division of General Practice uh, network also uh, runs some programs. This is an area we'd really like to see enhanced. We'd like all health professionals to have training in end-of-life care so that they can best provide that care for all members of the community. Now, the respecting patient choices person, uh, Emma or Nikki, at, uh, at the Canberra Hospital. Okay. And uh, we've got their contact details. As medical students and young doctors, I think we are often hardwired to save people's lives, rather than perhaps look at uh, patients' health in a, in a more holistic sense. And <clears throat> efforts are made, often made in, in hospital that in, in retrospect may be seen as being uh, unreasonable, uh, too optimistic I suppose with regard to patient recovery. However, I think in general practice, particularly when one has been in the field for a number of decades, you develop a more, well, a less mechanistic approach to health and you, you view the, the, the patient um, in, in, a, in their true context with regard to the ageing process and what they really want as individuals. Terrific. Okay, thanks. Bye. Okay, cheers. Now equipped with resources, Adele makes contact with the Respecting Patient Choices program and begins drawing up her advanced care plan. Hello, it's okay. nice to see you again. Also with her at today's appointment with Nikki is her chosen enduring power of attorney, Vic. To finish a, an advanced care plan, the most important people are obviously the person that we're needing to do the advanced care plan on, their chosen enduring power of attorney, and this, this choosing an enduring power of attorney is quite a complex thing because we need to choose people that are a going to be able to carry out what we've asked them to do. It's got to be somebody that's available at the time. Um, so they're a very important part of, of completing the advanced care plan. Other people involved are doctors, nurses, um, pastoral caregivers, any person that's important in, in the person's life so that they can be informed to make the best decisions for themselves. And I want to get it finished because oh, I've been trying be to good. do it for ages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that would be good. We can do that today. Um, and I understand, Vic, you've already signed the Enduring Power of Attorney yes. forms and it's really important that you're here today. Um, often Vic people don't, there's still, still some surprises sometimes at this end of, of the discussion so it's really important that we're all here together. As you know you've been thinking about your values and, mm -hmm. and your beliefs and um, you know you've been talking about your experiences with healthcare mm -hmm. and what living well means to you. We've mm -hmm. had a few of those discussions now mm -hmm. so um, we just need to get down to the nitty gritty. Yep. Um, and um, once we've done this document, uh, part of the important thing is to distribute it to people that are important mm -hmm. to you. Yeah, my GP asked if he could have a copy. Yeah, so we'll send a copy to your GP. Um, Vic will get a copy. Yourself, you will have the original. Mm -hmm. we, we can send them to all the hospitals here. Mm -hmm. It's probably the best thing to do. The documentation and forms that I use are from the Respecting Patient Choices program. They involve um, pamphlets of information, and then the two key parts of, of documentation are the statement of choices, which is getting the person to express their wishes, and the completed enduring power of attorney. Having said that, if a patient doesn't have access to these particular documents, it's not 
absolutely crucial that you use the right document. What is important is that the person has a chance to express their wishes with an enduring power of attorney, write them down, sign, date and witness it. And I'd like to just say that just to make the process a bit more simple, we don't need a barrier of the right paperwork. Okay, what about oral antibiotics? None. Okay. If I've got dementia, don't want anything that's going to keep me around in the world, thank you. Okay. And Vic knows that. Yes, so and if it's up to me, that's good because I can be very firm on this. Mm -hmm. But still, I would like it written down mm -hmm. so that if uh, any family some... members say, oh, no, she wouldn't have really wanted that, I can say, look, mm -hmm. I'm making decisions and okay. it's what she wanted because it's, it's written, written down. on this form. Absolutely. And we can write as much on this form as you want. Mm -hmm. This is your document. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Adele, um, now that we've had the document signed and witnessed mm -hmm. um, Thank you. and it's all complete, mm -hmm. I'm, what I'll do is make... Um, uh, quite a few copies. Mm -hmm. um, the original is yours to keep yep. and I suggest you... The process of doing an advanced care plan was much easier than I thought. Having that in place means that I feel a little bit more comfortable, that um, I don't have to feel anxious to know um, if I go to the hospital that they might resuscitate me um, when I don't want to be resuscitated and that I might end up um, living being alive but being not able to have any control of my life. So that's that's a great thing to know. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks thanks for coming today. Thanks and for all your the time. process of advanced care planning um, brings up lots of emotions, um, particularly from for the patients that I'm seeing because they have got a life-limiting illness. That's not always the case. Um, so it's a fairly emotive um, a process and they do need a lot of support. There's often tears from me and the patients <laughs> um, and it, it is a time for healing and discussion. It, it's a very important process and one that people generally get a lot out of. The other important advantage of an advanced care plan is that it takes a degree of burden off of not only the the family but also the, uh, the health staff so that decisions are made more easily and in a, in more easily and in a um, collegiate atmosphere. About 141,000 people died in Australia in 2009 and if we look at that logically that there are about three quarters of those people would have died from chronic diseases so they would have been anticipated deaths we're looking at about 100,000 Australians a year could benefit from access to palliative care. Advanced care planning gives people an active choice. They are in charge of their choices. Um, sometimes people in, in the healthcare system get steamrolled into treatment choices, treatment choices, and palliative care isn't always given as a choice. But if a person is well informed and they can make those choices earlier on, they can access palliative care as a choice. Um, and death isn't seen as a failure.